Hey guys, what's up? It's Big Jack Phillips here, and welcome to another commentary. I am so sorry I'm doing one of these and there's no new King Kong review. That's because I'm working on the next two episodes, but for the next 18 minutes, we're going to talk about this episode, which, yeah, that lining, outlining with that effect is pretty bad. Uh, that's using Eric Kessler's stop motion, but this is on... One of my favorite episodes, personally, that I worked on, and that is talking about the 1996 attempt at King Kong that Peter Jackson was going to do and never happened. Um, this episode aired as part of Season 3, and the whole Lost Kong Projects arc that was part of the start of Season 3 was all leading to this. This is what I really wanted to talk about the most, and so it took the most time out of me. Um, there have been stuff that has been come out since that, uh, episode aired. There's been other videos discussing the production from many other great, uh, content creators, but being the first one to bring it up was kind of cool. That, I guess I started this whole canceled production, uh, era of YouTubers, which is kind of cool. But a lot of it was using footage from other films like Jurassic Park, other films involving the cast uh, from other movies that they were in at the time, like Sense and Sensibility with uh, Kate Winslet. Now, something I did bring up is I only briefly mentioned Lord Linwood Darrow, who was in the original script, who was Anne's father. Um, I didn't really have any confirmation of who was going to be playing it, but from what I heard, it was supposedly going to be Ian McKellen, who would later play Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings, which I think would have been kind of cool. Had I known that, I would have talked about it. Um, the golden statue concept for a visual, I just took the statue from the Revenge of the Mummy ride. That was the best, uh, version I could find. But, uh, yeah, this episode was sort of, uh, the culmination of the episodes I had done prior. It was all building up to this. And originally it was just supposed to be talking about the, talking about these canceled productions. But eventually what happened was, it's like, oh, let me do a whole storyline with me on Skull Island and I'll make it a fun thing. And we'll come back to this at some point. I think about doing, like, a storyline compilation commentary, uh, discussing about it in more detail. But yeah, I, I'm one of those people, people ask me, oh, what would you would have preferred, George Clooney or Bruce Campbell as Jack Driscoll? I mean, both are great actors, but in terms of looking like the original, I would have gone with uh, Bruce Campbell, actually. I think he would have been great in that. But a lot of it was using things like the Legend of Tarzan uh, trailer, it, which ironically was just brand new. Uh, using the footage from the Peter Jackson remake to match, and it was really just about trying to make sort of a fan trailer before I made my own fan trailer, essentially. But, um, actually one thing I did kind of find out about when I did this episode, I actually did research outside of the DVDs and websites. I did reach out to a couple of people at Weta Workshop who worked on the movie, um, specifically uh, Daniel Falconer, who was a concept sketch designer. Later on Lord of the Rings, he did a lot of the details of the elven armor. I also contacted uh, Jimmy Bess Warwick, who was a famous uh, sculptor at Weta, who sculpted a lot of the dinosaurs and Kong during the 96 production, along with pretty much sculpting every goddamn creature in the Lord of the Rings. And I, I talked to them briefly about it. I said, you know, hey, do you guys have any info on what else uh, is unavailable to the public and stories about the 96 production. A lot of them were huge help in giving, talking about things I didn't know about. Like, I didn't know they were maybe at some points considering using a man in a suit because the CGI for uh, CG gorillas wasn't 100% there yet. So using footage from Mighty Joe did help uh, describe what I was talking about. And this is before, remember, Weta didn't really have the CG technology as they do today. Uh, it was mostly ILM because Jurassic Park had just come out. And that was another key factor in getting a remake off the ground was Jackson and Universal saying, we want our, we want another Jurassic Park. And that was sort of the idea was, let's do Indiana Jones meets Jurassic Park. That's sort of how I can describe the 1996 script. In fact, there's a paragraph that says, describes Skull Island in the jungles as Jurassic Park from hell. Uh, the script is kind of hokey. If you can find it online, I would definitely consider reading it because it's a much different beast than what we got. So a lot of it was, you know, using footage. But then also the music choice I decided to use is what they used on the DVD for the slideshows and documentary, which was the score to Waterworld. Now, I first heard the score on the DVD and loved it. Then watched the movie, and I said, I love this movie, and Waterworld is actually, for those who don't know, my favorite score of all time. Now, what's fun about shooting this stuff when I did, 
it was in the same locations we shot my remake. In fact, I produced these in the summer of 2016, literally around the time it was the last year of post-production on my remake. And there were still some sets and props left over from the production that I quickly kind of uh, strung together and said, we'll use these still. We still have a bit of t usage out of these. It was the last hurrah for a lot of it. Um, most notably, the raft. Uh, the raft used in Kong was left in the pond uh, there, so I made use of it when I could, and it was really starting to show decay. I think now if you go find the location where it is, that raft is just completely disintegrated. There's not really much of it left. But, um, yeah, what was great was the Deluxe Edition DVD was a good resource in grabbing a lot of the footage I needed for this episode. And it came out really well. Now, this is before anybody uploaded the, uh, the uh, documentary on YouTube. So this footage, I actually had to use my Pinnacle capture card software and connect it to a DVD player and record it because I had to get the footage. And so this was my only way of doing it. And this is, like, pretty powerful technology circa 2017. I was using a laptop... I think it was sort of the last hurrah for one of my laptops, although, um, eventually what happened, no, what happened was actually I was using my tower at this point, uh, my first big computer tower, which, uh, powered a lot of the rest of post-production on my remake, and then these episodes, um, and yeah, this is, I, I had to use stuff from Monster Madness and other sources, because again, this was 2017 before a lot of this was more available through YouTube, copyright was still somewhat of an issue at the point, at that point, and, Talking about it's great, I mean, not only did I talk to Daniel Falconer and um, uh, Jamie Bestwork, I also talked to Gino Acevedo, who was a makeup artist on Lord of the Rings and Kong. He did a lot of the makeup appliances. But also, before he passed away, I went to Comic-Con uh, around that time and met up with the wonderfully talented artist Bernie Wrightston, who um, had also done a lot of uh, DC comics. He did a lot of art, art illustrations for Swamp Thing, ironically, with the creature. But, um, and eventually, like, I got to talk to him because he was a huge concept artist on the remake of Kong for Jackson. And he had a lot to talk about. I never got a chance to record it. I wish I did. But I did, like, have a note to write down what he was talking about. And it was really fun to kind of, like, just discuss it with one of the best artists um, on that film. I wish there was... I know there's more concept art somewhere in Weta's archives that hasn't been released that you see in some of the documentaries. But it is very tough to find. It is very tough to, tough to find here. Another resource was uh, Ray Morton's book, The History of the Movie Icon, which um, has also been helping me with these latest episodes. So... Yeah, talking to Bernie Wrightston, talking to them, and also, yeah, there was a moment Jackson was going to do a remake of The Creature from the Black Lagoon. That did not end up happening, and eventually, um, that became The Shape of Water, I think. Which, you know, Guillermo del Toro was going to do The Hobbit, and then he did that instead. So it was cool to get, like, storyboards from the film, concept art. This concept art is fantastic. Part of me really wants to see them somehow adapt it, either as a film, a TV show, or even, like, a comic book. Uh, that's what I want to see is this being done as a comic book. In fact, if you use Bernie Wrightston's art as covers for the, uh, for the comic book adaptation, I would pay for it. That would be amazing if they were able to pull, pull that off. And yeah, there was a lot of stuff in the script, like Anne was supposed to be, like, in a fly trap. Um, watching The Legend of Tarzan, I was actually kind of like, oh yeah, this is probably what the movie would have looked like. And yeah, I think Robert De Niro would have been an amazing Carl Denham, and funny enough, he was almost, like, even after the project was cancelled and post Lord of the Rings and Jackson was talking about doing Kong, he wanted to do, um, Robert De Niro in the role, like, he wanted him as the first choice, but that didn't end up happening. Now, what I love about that concept of Carl Denham from the 96 remake, I don't know why, but he looks like Dr. Applecheeks from the Tom and Jerry movie, I, I, I fail to always mention that. But I figured I'd mention it here. But there's Daniel Falconer and all the concept art. You have Bernie Wrightston, Jamie Best Warwick. Um, Gary Oldman also would have been a good Carl Denham, honestly. But I think De Niro would have been better. He looks like Robert Armstrong, and I love that. I pointed that out that like both Bruce Campbell and Robert De Niro look like Robert Armstrong and Bruce Campbell. Anytime I could have used Gary Oldman from that film, I would have I, 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 would, I would use clips from that. But yeah, I would have picked Bruce Campbell. So, yeah, I bring this up as a joke, like, oh, huh, Bruce, hmm, Robert, I see a pattern. Now that pattern clip, that is from uh, The Giant Claw, a terrible, 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 terrible movie. 
And yeah, George was also at the time, like he had just done uh, those, and then also, I think the other thing was Batman and Robin had come out around the time Jackson wanted to use them, so I wonder if anybody was going to um, uh, probably use Clooney at the time. And I think that was the first time I used the I really want to apologize joke was in this episode uh, with the Schumacher. I always like using that when I can. Um, and what's funny is, too, is yeah, there was, um, yeah, that's this. I, I completely lost where I track. Okay, the, the the mechanical hand that they were going to build a practical hand at the time, and yes, Kate Winslet what was going to be Anne Darrow and was even in the 2005 film, but yeah, she wouldn't have done Titanic, I think. Although Titanic was, I think, pretty much done principal photography by the time this movie was going to start work filming. Um, but yeah, these stop-motion puppets are great. I hear they're still at Weta. Like, apparently when they did the Jackson remake, uh, eventually in 2005, they had all these dinosaur designs that they wanted to use from 96. In fact, that stampede came from it. And what happened was, is that when they were designing the brontosaur, Jackson just picked up the stop-motion model and said, we'll just use this, and they just had to re uh, sculpt it to make it more detailed. And yeah, so that was me at Fan Expo 2014. I had talked to Bernie Wrightston when I was doing my research. These these episodes took actually maybe about two or three years to in development in terms of uh, research and gathering notes and stuff. So, but yeah, those sculptures, like that painting in the background of Anne, that sketch of Anne being grabbed by Kong, um, that's an example of some of the concept art that never got uh, released to the public. But this mechanical ha uh, hand rig, they were going to use one. They were actually going to make one. And they ended up not using it because CG, by the time they did it, was finally there. And I feel like they might have recycled it for Treebeard. Uh, one of the hands that grabs, uh, 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 what is it, uh, Billy Boyd. Now, yeah, they were going to use this for the Brano Stampede. There's concept art in the, uh, from Weta. And what's interesting is that there was footage of, I was trying to find raw footage of the Pentacles. And at the time, it was pretty hard to find, so I had to go grab to the Lord of the Rings appendices and grab a location scouting uh, bit from the behind the scenes that would have uh, worked out that whole um, that whole bit of using the footage. Now, I know there's a YouTuber who actually found that footage of the CG Kong test fully, and I can't remember who it was. And I was thinking, like, how the hell did they find that? But there was a lot of different things that plagued into the production that never... Like, this didn't help. Godzilla 98 didn't help. A lot of that ended up fucking up the production. And maybe someday I'll talk about this movie fully. I don't know. Um, but yeah, there was going to be like three monster movies in 98. And ja and the production studio was like, nah, let's not do this, guys. It it's hard to tell if it was going to be released in December or summer of 98. That's the one thing I can never really fully figure out. Now, what's funny is a lot of this gory images I probably would not be able to show today. I hope this gets past the uh, uh, community guidelines. Now, I don't know why. This summed it up. This is back when Nostalgia Critic did uh, videos called Esalts, which are these tiny little meme things that he would come up with. And um, that, that one little clip wasn't from any particular review, but it did help out in describing how I felt. And actually, it's funny because around this time, James had reached out and saw these videos, and this is how we kind of became friends through these uh, episodes, because he was watching these, and like, oh, that's what was happening, because simultaneously when I was putting these out, um, James was doing Kongathon for Kong Skull Island. Now, this, this project, at some point, maybe I'll do a more extended episode on, but there was, there's very little to go on as a production, and people ask about that image. That is actually from Kongasking.net as a wallpaper that um, was fan art at the time. This is all fan art. But again, maybe someday I'll do a video on that project. And this was, I think, a fan art that somebody made at the time, which did also stem from the Bruce Campbell, Gary Oldman rumor that he was gonna, they were gonna be Jack and Anne as well. So, eventually what happened was Lord of the Rings, and I, I'll, I'll be honest, I love that, that sculpture they had built for Universal as a gift. I really want, like, a replica of it, or to see it up close. I think it would be phenomenal to take a look at. And there's Jamie doing the sculptures for Lord of the Rings. Uh, so people ask me, are you going to cover Lord of the Rings at some point? There is plans for that. I don't know when, but that is something eventually I'm going to talk about, because I fucking love Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, 
really was the series that made me want to tell stories. So I like even before I got into Kong, I loved Jackson's work with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It really was my Star Wars that uh, changed my life fully. Again, this is back when, like, the editing skills were a lot... Like, you, the quality of these episodes hasn't really aged the best because of the footage I was using. Um, but eventually, like, it, it came out to... Um, I mean, these are still some of my most successful episodes to date. So, yeah, it was eventually... I, I My opinion has changed on this movie. Uh, when you see the next King Kong review I've got cooking up, I'm going to be apologizing for my negative reception because that was like 10 years ago when I discussed this movie, and now my opinion has definitely changed to a more positive reception. Spoiler alert. And I love the, I love the concept art. So that's concept art of Herb getting eaten. The whole concept of Herb getting eaten by a dinosaur in my remake came from the 96 remake. That's another thing I should have pointed out, that a lot of the storyline in my remake came from... Uh, the 96 production, so it was me trying to adapt it because I was just obsessed with that production that I thought would have been a much better movie. And yeah, for me, The Mummy was sort of uh, King Kong, what Kong should have been in Jackson's remake like for the 96 production. It was the closest thing in terms of tone. And it's funny, because I think had they had done that Kong, I think maybe Kong Frontation would have stayed around a lot longer, and they probably would have found a different place to put um, to put, uh, Revenge of the Mummy. And yeah, this is probably the most, my favorite of the Lost productions, the productions that never got made. Now, this was obviously setting up that we were going to be filming the next two episodes at Universal, and, uh, we were going to be discussing Reign of Kong and Kong Skull Island. This was meant to set that up. Now, this animation, stop motion of Kong, is blue screen footage from... Uh, the sh uh, fan film Skull Island by Eric Kessler, and I was just essentially uh, using that to kind of show my adventures on Skull Island, and my version of Skull Island in the reviewer verse is kind of weird, because it's like stop-motion dinosaurs, CG dinosaurs, stop-motion Kong, like, the reviewer verse Skull Island is kind of weird, and it's weird also that I have essentially a pickup area to, to um, get out of there in case I needed to. Um, but a lot of the compositing on those shots was pretty difficult at the time. Now, yeah, again, I find it, it's kind of weird, like, wait, why is the Universal Park on Skull Island literally across from my viewpoint? Well, it's just the wall of Skull Island looks like the one from Orlando. It's, it's hard to explain, and this was also, um, when the 18 stuff started. Now, if you notice, I'm not holding the DVD, I'm holding the DVD to King Kong Lives, because that was the closest I could find to match. There was no, like, DVD cover for Kong Skull Island, because the movie actually did not come out yet. But that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back with more King Kong reviews down the line. I hope you enjoyed this commentary. So until the next video, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you guys later. This is Big Jack Film signing off, and more content is on the way. Don't miss it. We'll catch you next time. Take it easy. Oh.